So we're in Numbers chapter 19, and we're going to read the whole thing. I titled my message this morning, uh, Sprinkle Me With Water and Ashes. You ever wanted to be sprinkled with water and ashes before? Probably not. With water, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but hopefully when it's all said and done, you'll be saying the same thing. Sprinkle me with water and ashes. Amen. All right. Uh, Numbers chapter 19, starting at verse 1, and we're going to read the whole chapter. All right. Numbers 19, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, this is the ordinance of the law, which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke. And ye shall give her unto Eleazar the priest, that he may bring her forth without the camp, and one shall slay her before his face. And Eleazar the priest shall take of her blood with his finger, and sprinkle of her blood directly before the tabernacle of the congregation seven times. And one shall burn the heifer in his sight, her skin and her flesh and her blood with her dung shall he burn. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes and he shall bathe his flesh in water. And afterward he shall come into the camp and the priest shall be unclean until the evening. And he that burneth her shall wash his clothes in water and bathe his flesh in water and shall be unclean until the evening. And a man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and lay them up without the camp in a clean place. And it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for a water of separation. It is a purification for sin. And he that gathereth the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. And it shall be unto the children of Israel and unto the stranger that sojourneth among them for a statute forever. He that toucheth the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days. He shall purify himself with it on the third day, and on the seventh day he shall be clean. But if he purify not himself the third day... And on the seventh day he shall be clean. But if he purify not himself the third day, then the seventh day he shall not be clean. Whosoever toucheth the dead body of any man that is dead and purifieth not himself, defileth the tabernacle of the Lord. And that soul shall be cut off from Israel, because the water of separation was not sprinkled upon him. He shall be unclean. His uncleanness is yet upon him. This is the law. When a man dieth in a tent, all that come into the tent and all that is in the tent shall be unclean seven days. And every open vessel which hath no covering bound upon it is unclean. And whosoever toucheth one that is slain with a sword in the open fields or a dead body or a bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean seven days. And for an unclean person, they shall take of the ashes of the burnt heifer of purification for sin and running water shall be put thereto in a vessel. And a clean person shall take hyssop and dip it in the water and sprinkle it upon the tent and upon all the vessels and upon the persons that were there and upon him that touched a bone or one slain or one dead or a grave. And the clean person that sprinkle upon the unclean on the third day and on the seventh day and on the seventh day he shall purify himself and wash his clothes. And bathe himself in water, and shall be clean at evening. But the man that shall be unclean, and shall not purify himself, that soul shall be cut off from among the congregation, because he hath defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of separation hath not been sprinkled upon him. He is unclean. And it shall be a perpetual statute unto them, that he that sprinkleth the water of separation shall wash his clothes, and he that toucheth the water of separation shall be unclean until evening. And whatsoever the unclean person toucheth shall be unclean, and the soul that toucheth it shall be unclean until evening. Amen. 
And so what we see here, really, it's a ritual. It's an ordinance. It's the ritual of the ashes of the red heifer. I mean, anybody that's been in church for any length of time, at least back in the day, I can remember people mentioning the red heifer when I first got saved. Never really heard anything more about it too much. But as I read the scriptures, I knew that there was symbolism in here regarding sacrificial offering and regarding purification. You know, one of the things that we notice as we, as we read the scriptures together is a repetition in the scriptures. And the repetition that we keep seeing is, is that is that mankind is unclean. And we understand that it goes back to the, to the fall. We understand that God gave a pronouncement even in the garden and that whenever Adam and Eve transgressed God, it brought uncleanness upon them. And the result of that is that, yes, it did. It brought separation. And we see even in all the Old Testament sacrifices time and again, the shedding of innocent blood, certain rituals, spe specificities that have to take place, no blemish. No, there can be no tumors, no blemish, no marks, uh, that which would represent it, it, really it was a type. It was showing us a foreshadowing of the fact that Jesus would come and that he was going to be without sin and that he was going to be the offering that was ultimately needed to pay the final penalty of the sin that humanity had. Sometimes people, you know, I know that I've been accused of preaching the same thing time and again, especially at the old church. You know, it's like, man, dude, all you ever talk about is the cross. Well, let me just say something. It's not me. It's not my fault. I'm telling you. I mean, you may not like the fact that I say use the same words sometimes, use same phrases sometimes, but the repetitive nature of the scriptures themselves, the scriptures keep repeating themselves. As a matter of fact, just in this one chapter alone, the word sprinkle is used four times, the words wash or bathe are used seven times, and a variant form of the word purify is used six different times. God is repetitive. God is re repetitious in his teaching of his people. You know why? Because he knows we're going to forget. He knows that if I tell you something today, you're not going to remember it tomorrow. Because he told Israel throughout the entirety of their journey, you're a stiff-necked people. You're a hard-headed people. You're a stubborn people. And just as soon as we think we got something figured out, lo and behold, if we're honest with one another, if we look in the mirror, James said, don't be like the man that looks in the mirror. And as soon as he turns away, he forgets what matter of a man that he really is. After we've been in the faith for a while, we can, if we're not careful, contract a disease. It's called a disease of self-righteousness. We begin to look at ourselves and we begin to believe that we're a whole lot better off than what we really are. We don't have time to preach about relative righteousness. I've talked about it many a times, but the difference between relative righteousness and imputed righteousness is that relative righteousness looks at me in relation to someone else or me in relation to the way that I used to be and I think because of that, it's all good. In other words, I raise two hands, you raise one hand, I'm more righteous than you. That's relative. That's not the standard of God's righteousness. Yeah. I don't drink or do drugs anymore. That's relative. That's yeah. not the standard of God's righteousness. True righteousness from God is Jesus. He's the standard. He's the plumb line. And if you're doing it contrary to the way that he would do it, then you fall short of the glory of God. The very word sin means to miss the mark. And God has a plan where he allows Jesus' righteousness to be given unto us. And that's what all of the Old Testament sacrifices entail. And that's what this particular Old Testament sacrifice entails also. There's so much information regarding this red heifer. I think tonight we're not we're going to hold off on Jonah. And I want to cover one main concept tonight about the ashes of the red heifer that really stuck out to me. That was really good. But essentially right now, I just would like to remind you, you know, just kind of like let's just tell the story basically of what's going on. I mean, we just read it, but, but let's just be reminded of it. Uh, you know, we have to understand. Understand that God was all and this is during the time frame in the book of Numbers whenever his people have not entered into the promised land yet. We're, we're between the place where we've crossed out of Egypt. We've crossed the Red Sea. That means we're saved now. According to New Testament theology, the exodus from Egypt would represent God saving us out of the world and out of the dominion of the evil one. Amen. We've already talked, we've talked about that many times. Pharaoh, a type of the enemy. Egypt, a type of the world. So we're between salvation and sanctification, if you will. The entering into the promised land is the place that where we've now sanctification never stops. It's always progressive. The word sanctified means to be separated unto God, to be made holy unto God. The day that you were saved, you were literally separated unto God. You were made holy in the eyes of God already, right then and there. You'll never be more holy than what you were on the day that you got saved. What are you talking about? The way that God sees you. 
The day that you got saved, you were clothed with Jesus. You were given his righteousness. Yeah. Now the Father says you're holy. Amen? Amen. But you have to begin to understand that. You have to begin to see yourself the way that God sees you. And that takes a process of time. That's a, that's a process that, that, that happens over a period of time as the Holy Spirit through the Word of God begins to reveal that truth to your heart. The other night in, on the Thursday night Bible study, we covered the fact that in Romans 4, God said to Abraham, you're justified by faith. I, I don't really have time to break that down this morning, but to make it easy, the word justified or he counted Abraham as righteous because of his faith. It means he put righteousness in Abraham's account because of his faith. It means that God said, Abraham, you believed me. And we've already talked about what Abraham believed him for. He believed him for a promised son. And he put a wood on the lad's back and he carried it up a hill for a sacrifice. He believed without really understanding at all completely Jesus Christ and him crucified. Abraham had faith in God's eternal plan. And because Abraham was willing to believe God, God put righteousness yes. into his account. Amen? Amen. But then it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 11, that you now therefore have to reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now the interesting thing is, is that the word reckon in the Greek and the word accounted in chapter 4 is the same exact word. So it, the idea is, is that it was put, you have to put it into account. You have to, you have to believe about yourself the same thing that God believes about you. Amen? And I want you to understand, so that's the process of sanctification. You learning and beginning to believe what God says in His Word about you. That when you put your faith in what God offered, it made you righteous in the eyes of God. Amen? And so where we are in this story is... Where we've crossed the, the Red Sea, and, and, and but we haven't entered Jordan. And so we're in this wilderness experience. And God knows that his people are going to, he, he has set up all of these rites of purification. Two times a day there's a whole burnt offering offered on the altar. Uh, with a meat offering. We talked about last time about the peace offering. That meaning that we were at peace with God and communion was restored. And each time a, the, the brother or the sister sinned, they had to bring a sin offering into the gate. They had to lay their hand on the animal and transfer their guilt over to the animal. And the animal was killed in their stead. In other words, that innocent animal that had nothing to do with their sin had to die in their place. Why does the Bible, see people want to move past the cross, they want to move past the blood because it's bloody and it constantly reminds us of sin. You can't move past it if you're going to read and study the scripture because God keeps bringing us back there because the problem with humanity is sin. Not just because when he was born in Adam, but because he continues to transgress the ways of God. He continues to go against God and because of that, he finds himself in a place of separation. But the blood of Jesus continually cleanses us. Amen. And continually makes us righteous as long as our faith remains in what God has done for us. Yeah. And so we see these rites of purification and the ashes of the red heifer, even though there is no altar, even though there is not the normal ritual that takes place, is all still a sacrifice of purification. And we see that really and truly in this story, it has something to do with death. And it has something to do with the, the shedding of some blood. And it has something to do with rites of purification. But essentially what would happen is, is that if you came in the close proximity of a dead person, any kind of a dead animal, you were considered unclean. And the only way that you would be able to be made pure is if you were sprinkled with the ashes of a red heifer. And so what would have to happen is that the priest would take the heifer on the outside of the camp. Take them outside the city. And there he would sacrifice the animal. Now, there's a lot that went into determining whether or not this heifer was really acceptable unto, uh, to be able to be utilized in this fashion. One thing that I heard was that, uh, that the when it was first born, it could only have, if I'm not mistaken, two red hairs. But then at the point in time that it came to full development, its entire, the majority of its coat was red. But really, the color of the red was a little bit of a different red than you would expect. I thought about putting a picture up, but you can Google it later. It was almost like a brownish type red. And so it had the color either of the earth 
and also of coagulating blood. And so it was a different kind of a color red, but it was a distinct redness that had to be in this particular heifer. And there were other certain uh, qualifications that had to take place in order for this animal to be able to be utilized. We're going to talk about it a little bit more, but number one, it had to be a heifer. So it had to be red, it had to be a heifer. What does that mean? It means it had to be female. It couldn't be a male. It, it had to be a female animal, and not only that, it couldn't have never had a yoke upon it. It, it, it never was able to be yoked up. You know, we talked about a yoke last week, but we'll talk about it again here. We're not talking about an egg yoke. We're talking about work. And, so it had, and, then, it, and then it had to be brought outside the camp and killed out there. And, and whenever it was killed, there was, you know, some blood that was spilled. But it was different than the normal sacrifices where whenever the animal was killed in the normal sacrifices, all of its blood was allowed to be poured out and to be collected. That's why God said in the book of Leviticus, in chapter 17, he said that I've given you blood to make atonement for your soul, for the life of the creature is in the blood. See, the shedding of the blood has to do with the death of the creature. Because, see, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. <laughs> so as you see that the life of the creature is in the blood, as the blood is poured out, then the life of the creature is also poured out. And now, in that sense, that innocent creature, that innocent animal has now paid the penalty of sin for Israel at that point in time or for that believer that brought that animal at that point in time. This, this sacrifice was different than that. All of his blood wasn't poured out, but, but inevitably some blood through the sacrifice of the, the killing of the animal was shed. And one of the things that had to take place was that that priest would take some of that blood and he would sprinkle it towards the tabernacle seven times. We understand that seven is the number of fulfillment and completion, but he was sprinkling it purposefully towards the tabernacle. I mean, you don't understand that the tabernacle would have been on the inside of the city later, at least in Jerusalem, once the temple was in there, or wherever they were at this point in time, as he brought it, even, even if you will remember, I mean, some of you that have been with us for a while, the structure of the tabernacle had a gate around it. And when you first walked up, there was the, burnt, the, the, the altar of burnt offering was right there. You, you had to do business with God right then and there. You have to, if you're going to come into relationship with God, you've got to come to the cross. The, the altar of burnt offering is representative of the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. And then the next thing behind that was the bronze laver. That was where the priest would wash himself. Now, we've talked about this many times, but, but whenever the, the way that it was made was it says specifically it was made with the looking glasses of the women. Now, there wasn't glass back then. It would have been a shiny, polished metal material that was at the bottom of the bronze laver. When the priest looked down after he killed an animal and he spattered with blood and he go to wash himself, he sees a reflection of himself in the laver. He sees the, 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 what had to take place, the, the bloody sacrifice that had to be offered, and it's a reminder. And, this, and what this represents is the represents the Word of God. Because when you get into the Word of God, it's not only going to show you that you're a sinner, but it's also going to show you that there's a solution for your sin. In, and it was the shedding of blood yes. that God offered from the beginning to the end. It's never going to change. It's God's plan. And if you're going to meet him, you're going to meet him on his terms. Or you're just going to think you're meeting him. And the reality of it is, is that you never really did. That's why he will say to many on that day, depart from me. For I never even knew you. We're in the midst of a church. Listen to me. As time, I know I'm going on a little trail right now, but I think that the Lord wants me to go on a trail. In the midst of a time whenever havoc is being wreaked upon the face of the earth. Listen to me. I said it in my prayer, but I'm going to say it again. The spirit of Antichrist, the power of the prince of the air that works in the children of disobedience is moving rampantly upon the face of the earth. If we're not in the last days now, Lord, help us. I don't see how we can make it another 20 years when we see the hand of Islam and what it's doing across the world. And not just that, but people doing some of the most outrageous things that you ever want to see or you ever want to know. The truck and France that killed the 80. They're trying to take over the government in Turkey. The Orlando shooting. And, and the first thing that they want to do after that, like I told you, is take the guns of American citizens away. I'm telling you, we got a problem. What are they going to do? They're going to take people's trucks away next? It's not the truck. It's not the gun. It's the sin yes. of the people. It's the heart of people who have yes. rejected Jesus Christ. And yes. it's the spirit of Antichrist that's moving the world towards the end. But I'm here to tell you that God's got a plan. Amen. Amen. He's got a plan. And 
It's a plan of purification. And it's a plan to deal with the heart of man. And what we see going back to the tabernacle is that, the, you know, here's the bronze altar. Here is the, the, the bronze laver. And within the tent itself was the various furnishings and where the worship on the inside took place. The point I'm trying to make is, is that the cow could not be killed. The heifer could not be killed on the inside of the wall of the tabernacle. It was a tent. You understand that? The old, before the temple was built, before Solomon built the temple, it was a tent, right? And so the animal had to be taken outside the gate and it was killed outside the gate. All right. And, and, and whenever once it, but once it was killed and some of that blood was shed, it was sprinkled back towards the tabernacle, facing towards the tabernacle. OK, well, the reason why is because on multiple occasions, it tells us, at least in verse 13 and 20, it tells us that if you do not purify yourself, if you come into contact with the dead and you do not purify yourself, then you defile the tabernacle of the Lord. You cannot bring your sin into the presence of God. And so that priest would go out there and he'd kill that animal and he'd sprinkle that blood towards the tabernacle. And then what they would do is they would burn the whole thing. They'd burn the whole animal, the skin, the dung, the blood. The blood was in the animal. And I know I, keep, I, I get all excited about this. You may not remember, but I never I did understand. And there's many passages of the, in the scripture where it talks about sprinkling with water. And there's even scriptures where it talks about sprinkling with water and that it caused cleansing. But I understand and know from studying the scriptures that true cleansing comes from the blood of the animal. Amen. And so I never really, I was missing it. And then one day the Lord let me see it. No, it's because the blood wasn't poured out of this. When it said it specifically in the chapter, you burn the blood in the body of this animal. It's all contained in there. And then you have to collect the ashes and the ashes are utilized as they're applied into water to be made for purification and cleansing. And so if you'll notice, what happens is, is that they, the, the priest it becomes unclean because he touched the animal on the outside. And he has a certain ritual that he has to go through. He's got to wash his clothes. He's got to bathe his flesh. Then a clean person has to come and get the ashes. And he has to collect the ashes. And then he's unclean. He has to bathe himself. Uh, he has to bathe his flesh. He has to clean his clothes. And everybody that comes into contact, even with this water of purification, he also, he's now become made unclean. And he has to cleanse his own self and purify his own self. What you and I need to understand is this, is that what God's reminding them is that just because you're the priest that's chosen to bring this animal outside the camp and offer it up, it doesn't make you any better than anybody else. Amen. You're born of Adam yes. and you're born of sin and you also need yes. purification. And the same one that gathers up the clean ashes and the same one that came into the presence of a dead person. Yes. You didn't even have to, it was, it's not even your fault. You just walked up in the tent one day, hey honey, I'm home, and, and there's somebody's dead right there in the tent. Grandpa died. You didn't even know it. You walked in the tent and he's dead. And not only is he unclean, and now you're unclean, and now every vessel in the house is unclean. In the open container, man, I left my cup of water right there. I'm thirsty, you can't drink. It's unclean. Everything's unclean. Death. Death has ensued. It's touched this place. It's made everything unclean. And so then they had to take hyssop after they had these ashes. And they would take just a little pinch. From the way the story goes, it's just a little pinch is all it takes. And they'd put it in this water and they would make this solution. Just a little bit of ash in the water. You can't even see it. It's hidden. It's a solution. And then it would take hyssop. The same absorbent plant that was used to strike the doorpost and the side post in the Passover, whenever God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, that same plant. But not only that, when they burned it, they took hyssop and threw it in the fire. They took cedar wood, threw it in the fire. They took scarlet wool, threw it in the fire. Similar type ritual that took place in the book of Leviticus for the leper, if you'll remember. We taught on that a while back. But in that case, it was two doves. And they would take running water and they would tear, wring the neck of one dove under the running water. And they'd throw hyssop and scarlet <coughs> wool and cedar wood in that water. And they would take another dove that was alive and they would slip it up under the water and they'd let it fly. And they could imagine and see all this bloody water f flying all over the place as this dove took off. But it was representative of death, burial, and resurrection. It was the purification water of the cleansing of a leper that had been healed. Leprosy was uncleanness, death. 
is uncleanness. God repetitively reminding us that in our first birth of Adam, we found unclean. And so that's what would happen. It was the waters of, of purification. But one of the one of the first things that I really want to talk to you about really has to do with three main things really that stick out in my mind from this has to do with the uncleanness of death the need for purification, and then the connection that it has to the tabernacle. It becomes real clear that the whole reason that this purification has to take place is because they've been defiled, they've been made unclean, and because of that, they cannot come into the presence of God. And so in order for communion to be reestablished, then they have to go through the rites of this purification, and this whole process has to take place. So when they came near or touched the, the, the dead, then they had to go through these rites of purification. The effects of the dead, the effects of the fall had now touched them. The scripture says in Genesis chapter 2 verse 17, it says that God told Adam and Eve in the garden, he said, you can eat from any tree, but you cannot eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if you eat of that tree in the day that you eat thereof, surely you shall die. And so what we see here is that we see the effects of the fall. We, we see that because of the fall, death has been pronounced. Now, if you really read the story, you begin to understand that it just wasn't physical death. Physical death didn't take place for quite some time. But that in reality, it resulted in spiritual death. It resulted in a spiritual separation. We see that ultimately with the expulsion from the garden in the end of chapter 3 where they were sent outside of the garden, right? And the cherubims were there with flaming swords. And so we see that the physical death of the Old Testament is representative of spiritual death. Mankind born in, of Adam and born in sin is born spiritually dead. He's born separated from the life of God. He's born separated from the presence of God. You know, truth be told, one of the things that we need to understand is, is that death is the opposite of life. I know that sounds real silly, real simple, but God is life. And the further we move towards death, the further we move away from the life of God. And in this story, what we're told is, is that they've come near or they've touched death. And now, because of that, they've been moved away from the presence of God, and they now are defiled, and they cannot come in to worship the Lord. And so that's the first thing that we see, is the uncleanness of death, which results in the need for purification. In chapter 19, verses 5 through 6, it says, Then one shall burn the heifer in his sight, her skin and her flesh and her blood with her dung shall he burn. That's what they did in order to make this solution. But its purpose is found in verse 9. And a man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and lay them up without the camp in a clean place. And it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for a water of separation. It is a purification for sin. Now I want you to, I want you to understand too that when we talk about the word separation, at least as a New Testament Christian, one of the thoughts that we should think about is that word sanctification. That's a big old word, and sometimes people get scared, scared of big words, but literally what it means is to be made holy or to be made separate. So as sin separates you from God, God's plan separates you from sin. And it pulls you away from sin, it pulls you away from the world, and it separates you unto God. And so these waters were waters for purification, and that they were waters for separation to take you from the place of separation of sin to now bring you back to a place of purification where you could have a relationship with the Lord. So it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we just want to talk to you a little bit about sanctification and about the connection of what this allowed in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 13 and 14 
It says, but we are bound to give thanks <clears throat> always to God for you, <clears throat> brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what he's saying is, is that you beginning, he chose you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. The whole body of God's truth is related once again to the shedding of innocent blood and faith in that, allowing you now to be restored into the presence of God. But notice, I want you to, what I really wanted you to see through that scripture was the connection between sanctification and the spirit. That's really what makes us different than the world. I know I've said this many times before, but this, it bears repeating. Because once again, as I started preaching early on, I made the comment that there's many times that we gain this level of superiority in our minds. We gain this level of self-righteousness in our minds. And we look, at, I was talking to somebody yesterday. Somebody that, that's a Christian in another church that looks down on a person that's in another church because of their past. Rather than because they don't have an understanding of the gospel. Amen. Then, uh, me, somebody else in here. I remember having a conversation with them about four weeks ago. People still try to hold them to their past because they don't have a revelation of what the gospel really said. <laughs> oh, I didn't have a problem with, it, with what it is that you dealt with. And so therefore, I'm better than you are. No, the thing of it is, is this. And then sometimes when we do get saved before we really have a revelation of the gospel, we begin to think more highly of ourselves than what we ought to. And really and truly, the thing that makes us different than the world around us isn't what we do, how much we go to church, how much we read our Bible. Instead, it's the fact that the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us and he doesn't live on the inside of the world. If you're not born again... Bad news flash, the Holy Spirit doesn't live in your heart. The way that you're born again is, is you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ and you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And so what I need you to know is this, is that the sanctification and in the ashes of the red heifer, we'll look at it a little bit more tonight. There's definite connection or a symbology, if you will, that's showing us that there's an unseen nature to what's going on here. It's the Holy Spirit working in tandem with the sacrifice of Jesus that's changing people and that ultimately begins to separate us. Amen. It's the Holy Spirit that's doing the work on the inside of our lives. And he's doing it based upon what Jesus did for us yes. at the cross. Amen. And our faith in that allows the Holy Spirit to do his work. So that's what it's talking about in, in 2 Thessalonians. See, the water was a water of separation. Mm -hmm. It was a water of purification. The New Testament thought that I'm trying to get through to you right now is, is that that word sanctification means those very things. It means to be separated. It means to be purified. It means to be made holy. There's another scripture right here. And, and what I really like about this one is it actually has the word sprinkling in it. So it reminds me that there's, it tells me that Peter, when the Holy Spirit dealt with his heart to write this, that Peter was thinking, I believe, about this very ritual. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So, you know, that verse has so much truth in it, so much good stuff, it's almost hard not to try to break it down. You know, the, the word elect comes from the from the Greek word eklektos. See, y'all heard me talk about that before. And it means to be the, the word the word eklektos, it means to be chosen out. Eklektos. Chosen out. But what were you chosen out from? Who said that? <laughs> That's right. Chosen out from the world. You know, the word church, this word here means out. Lectos is where we get the word election, chosen out. The word church, I've said this before, is ecclesia. And what does that mean? It means out called. The church is supposed to be a group of out called ones. Called out of what? Called out of the world. Chosen out of what? Chosen out of the world. How were you done that? 
through the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, Amen. through his sacrifice and the purification that was offered up by the Father, and your resultant faith in God's plan, hallelujah, you were called out, you were chosen out of the world into his marvelous light, and now the Holy Ghost lives on the inside of you, and now you're sanctified, you're purified, and you've been made separated from the world that's around you. Amen. Amen. And that's what the ashes of the hallelujah is. That's what the ashes of the red heifer symbolize. It's a calling, it's a purification, it's a separating out. You were near the death of sin. Sin has made you unclean, but now you've been called out, and now, hallelujah, you're in a place where you can be restored. But listen, I wanted to real quick talk about <clears throat> some things really having to do with the heifer itself. I mean, first off, the heifer was red, right? And like I said, the heifer was a heifer. <laughs> no yoke. Oh, man. No yoke. And outside the camp. All these things, I hope you're not being bored. I hope I'm not putting you to sleep. Sometimes whenever you go from preaching to teaching, it gets people, they get bored. But you know what? We need to learn things. Amen? We need to learn things about the gospel. We need to have it in our spirit. We need to understand it, right? So that we can truly understand the meat of the word. And we don't want to just understand the simple things of the word. That Paul, Paul rebuked Corinth. And he told him that, he said, you should be eating meat, but you're still sipping milk. And the reality of it is, is that as we mature in the Lord, we need to be able to start seeing Jesus Christ and him crucified in the entirety of the scriptures, because that's what all of the Bible is teaching. Amen. So the, uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about had to do with red. And, and, you know, I've already talked to you here recently about the fact that the name Adam has to do with red. Why? Because the earth is red. The, earth, the, the dirt from the ground, if you've ever been to Mississippi or certain parts of Alabama, well, you know what I'm talking about. The earth is red over there. And so in some way, shape, or form, I believe that the color of this heifer, it has a purpose in being red for two different reasons. Number one, it screams to us and reminds us, and it reminded all of the Israelites of the color of Adam and the fact that he was formed from the dirt of the ground and that now born of Adam, they were born in sin. And so the color of red not only represents blood, but it also represents the sin of Adam, but yet at the same time, it also represents the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Because, you know, it's only God that would do something like this where he would allow death to deal with death. God does things completely different than you and I could ever imagine. We can't figure him out. So, you know, all we can do is keep on trying because we're supposed to be studious. But the reality of it is, is that God says my ways are above your ways. My thoughts are above your thoughts. And he allows death to take care of death. So the death of sin is taken care of and eradicated through the death and the blood of Jesus. I want to talk a little bit more about the color of this red tonight and the fact that it was the color of coagulated blood. I believe that there's something symbolic in there. There's, there's something to that, but we'll get into that a little bit more tonight. And so the, the, the fact also that this, this, fe this was a female, it was a female, it was a heifer. It wasn't a bull. And, you know, one of the interesting things that I, that I ran across was that it was said by the rabbis that the rabbis believed that this purification in some way represented Messiah. And they felt like that this heifer was a female because in some way Messiah would be able to give new life, would be able to give birth and new life. Now, we understand, hallelujah, that the scripture says in Ezekiel chapter 36, 25 through 27, we, we've used that scripture quite a few times, but you know, once again, we need to go to it because it talks about new life and it talks about sprinkling. Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. This is the Old Testament passage where the Holy Spirit is speaking through to the Apostle Ezekiel. I'm sorry, the prophet Ezekiel and telling the people of God about the new covenant, about the new one that he's going to make. Talking about the day that he's going to send Jesus. They don't know that, but this, that's what it's saying. It's a prophecy. 
He says, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. Now we already learned that the water wasn't just water, but that it was actually water that had the ashes of the heifer in it. And you shall be made clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. It's new. Descriptive of new life, a new heart, and a new spirit will I put within you. It's not just a new heart, but it's also a new spirit. Amen. And, and it says, and, and, and I will take away your stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And so what we see with a heifer is that it's a female. And a female is able to give birth and to bring forth new life. And the rabbis, see the rabbis, even in the Jews today, they don't believe that Jesus was Messiah. They're still waiting for their Messiah to come. And so they could see a little bit of it. Paul even said that, that, the, that the reading of the Old Testament was still veiled before them because they couldn't see Jesus in the Old Testament. And, and because they still wait for their Messiah to come... The reality of it is, is this, is that he's already come, amen, and, and they missed it. But I wanted you to see that, that the heifer brings forth uh, new life, amen. And so it says, uh, it also, John, G, in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus, if you'll remember that story, Nicodemus came to him. Nicodemus came to Jesus in the middle of the night. He was walking in darkness. His eyes were blinded. That's the way John would write. Holy Spirit through John. He's not walking in darkness on accident. It's, it's also an illustration of his spiritual condition. It was nighttime and he couldn't see. As a matter of fact, Jesus told him. Whenever Jesus told him that a man must be born again. See, we're talking about new life. In the new covenant, that's the thing that you need to understand. How am I ever going to get out of this mess that I am? You were born dead in Adam, but whenever you come to Jesus, you're born again and he gives you new life. And everything Amen. that you thought that you never had hope for in the past and everything that ever plagued your past, God kills it at Calvary, buries it in the tomb with Amen. Jesus. And when, you and when he resurrected, you resurrected with him. He gave you a transfusion. He gave you a new heart. Amen. He gave you a new spirit and he put his spirit on the inside of you. And even though you were weak, come on. Somebody, he's gonna make you strong. Yeah. Hallelujah! And it's the Holy Spirit doing it. You can't just hunker down like Daddy used to say. And then pull your bootstraps up, bring your lunch. You going We're gonna be here a while, boy. We're gonna fight. You can't fight that kind of fight here. No, the weak are made strong in Christ Jesus as they're infused with a power from on high. The Holy Spirit moving in them. Hallelujah! And then operating in their lives. But whenever you don't know it. When you're blind to it, you can't put your faith in it. Right. And, and that's what Nicodemus' problem was. Jesus actually ended up telling him, after he talked to him about being born again, he said, you're the teacher of Israel, and you don't know these things? And so just as Nicodemus, the rabbis today, their eyes are veiled to the truth of the gospel. They cannot see Jesus written in the Old Testament. And if we're not careful and we're not willing to study the Old Testament, we won't see him in there either. I used to just, people used to say, man, I don't read the Old Testament because it's just the Old Testament law and it doesn't have anything. No, man, Jesus is all throughout these pages. Amen. His sacrifice Amen. is all throughout these pages. And if you love the word, you'll love to study and to find the treasure of God's word and where Jesus is hidden in there, where he was preparing humanity to know, listen to me, if you wanted to know me and know my ways, I wrote it in advance so that you could yes. see it, amen? amen? He said in John chapter 3, verse 3, said unto him, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So she was red, <clears throat> the color of sin, the color of the earth, <clears throat> the color of the blood that was shed. She was a heifer. She gave, she could give birth, she could give new life. But never a yoke came upon her. Now, we've talked about yoke. I've preached on yokes before. It's Y-O-K-E, right? Not Y-O-L-K. And, and it was, a, and I know that we, we talked about this even in the last couple of weeks, but pretty soon you're going to really know what it is, right? It was like two wooden, two pieces of wood that would maybe like come like this and then have <clears throat> two humps and then a straight bar in the middle again and then kind of do the same thing on the bottom. And what they would do is, is that they would take two beasts of burden and they put them side by side and then they'd yoke them together. They'd, and I don't know that they had screws, but in some way they'd be able to strap 
that yoke together. And what it did was it allowed them to plow with more force. So now they had double ox power, double heifer power, double power instead of just single power, right? Pulling the plow to be like, you know, I mean, you ever watch somebody plow like in the old days, man, that, that, that ground was hard and they had to rip it open, right? Just like sometimes our hearts need to be ripped open, the soil of our heart ripped open so that it can receive the, so the, the, the seed of the good news. Sometimes whenever you first walked them in the church, you, you're like, man, it's falling asleep. You had to do holler and scream. I don't understand it. You said your heart wasn't really prepared. Right. Your heart wasn't really ready. Right. But let, let the Lord put the plow on your heart yes. for a little bit. Let yes. him rip open the soil, that hard soil that's caused that cross, right? And, and he'll prepare your heart to receive the seed Amen. of the gospel. And then the next thing you know, you're, it's like, man, I'm actually interested in what, what's being said is the, is the light, it's the word of God. Amen. And you're becoming interested in it and it's yes. doing a work on the inside of you. So the yoke represents work. But there could have never been a yoke on this heifer. And one of the things that you and I need to understand is this, is that man can't partner and plow with this heifer. Man can't put a yoke on this heifer and use it for work because God's work is this is this because this heifer represents salvation. And man has no part in God's salvation. That's why God told man never to put a chisel on a stone when he built an altar. Because he didn't want man's hands taking any credit for the work that he had done. And God's salvation work is all of God, all of Jesus, none of man. It takes you to take your faith that he gave you and you put it in what it is that he did. But you can't clean yourself up. You can't do enough work. You can't read enough, go to church enough, join enough ministries. All we need help. But you can't do any of that enough in order to make yourself purified in the eyes of God. You can't, but he, God does want you to yoke up with him now. Hold on a second. But you can't yoke up and you can't do the work of salvation. Ch Titus chapter 3, verse 5. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, the word says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's not by works of righteousness, what you did, but it's by what Jesus did. And through that, there's a washing of regeneration that takes place. You know, I'm not trying to get all technical, but I thought this was pretty cool. I just happened to look up that word regeneration. It's a big Greek word. But it, this is basically what it, how it's written. Telegogenesis. That's, it, Genesis means a birth. Literally, the word means birth, renewal, restoration, renovation. And, and, and just as the, the sprinkling of the ashes of the red heifer, the sacrifice of Jesus provided a washing, and it, the whole thing provided a new birth, provided a renovation, provided a restoration, took you from the old, hallelujah, brought you to the new. Amen. Amen. And, and, and But like I said, you can't put a yoke on this heifer and man cannot do any work regarding the salvation work of God. Nevertheless, God wants you to yoke up with him and connect yourself to his salvation. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 29, he said in that verse, he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You ever felt that way before? Mm -hmm. Heavy, weary and heavy laden. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes life can take a toll on you. Yes. Sometimes I like being at work. I'm not going to lie to you. I see 40, 50 patients, man, in a day. It's like I'm worn out. But you know what? I ain't even got time to think. Mm -hmm. I, I just like, I'm, I'm like operating like a robot. You know, and, and it's like, next thing you know, the day's over, and then we can start all over again. Because I'm just going to be honest with you. Sometimes whenever you got to stop and think too much, this, this life is going crazy. Lord, just help me keep my eyes on you and get me through this thing. I can tell you, sometimes I don't know how to pray. My favorite prayer, I think, that I've ever prayed. Two prayers that I've never prayed that are my favorite prayer. Number one, Lord, I don't know what's best for me. I just don't. If I start praying for my own will in this thing, I'm going to mess it all up. Amen. So I pray that you take me by the shirt collar and you pull me through this thing called life. I hope he, I hope he honors that prayer. And the other one is, Lord, weld my hands to the plow. 
Amen. So that I don't ever quit on preaching the gospel. Amen. Sometimes, Amen. sometimes this crazy world it wears you down. But, but listen to me. God, Jesus said, come unto me, ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you Amen. and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. There is rest to be found when we yoke ourselves to Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can't do the work of salvation. But when you yoke yourself to his sacrifice through faith in what he did, now you come into common union with him. You come into connection with him. And now he's the one that's doing the work, amen, of the ministry in your life. And he's the one that's giving you the strength that you need. Yes. And you're learning to rest in him instead of accomplishing it amen. in your own strength. Amen. I'm going to be honest with you. I could preach that every service. Amen. Amen. Matter of fact, maybe I ought to do that. <laughs> Throw that verse in there every single service I preach. You know why? I want your notes. Hey, Amen. I'll give you these notes, sister. That's no problem. <laughs> Listen to me. You know why I need to preach that every time? Because we're going to forget. Come Tuesday and we're going to pick it back up. Yeah. We're going to try to pick up the burden. Yeah. We're going to try to pick up the heaviness. And we're going to try in our own strength Amen. to accomplish things yes. that only God can do in our lives. Yes. He wants you to learn how to rest in the salvation that he purchased for you. This is the last point that I really wanted to try to make about, about this, and it had to do with communion with God. See, because in verses 13 and 20 of the passage that we were reading, it talked about if he's not purified, then he, he's going to be cut off. In the book of Leviticus, it talked about if they were cut off, it meant they had to be died. They had to die. They had to be stoned. Because if they weren't purified, then they were going to defile the tabernacle of the Lord, where the God's presence dwelt. The thing having to do with the tabernacle, it's unquestionable what it's talking about. We've already discussed this on multiple occasions. The origination of sin caused a separation from the presence of God outside of the garden. But we understand that God told Moses to build him a tabernacle. Why? So that his presence could dwell with his people. We understand that beyond the veil in the Holy of Holies upon the Ark of the Covenant was a mercy seat. And there God said, I will meet with my people, my presence will dwell with my people. And so it required them to be purified so that they could now join again in communion with God. Amen. And you and I, born of Adam, are born in sin and defiled. And God desires to have communion with us and for us to be able to be in his presence. And so therefore he offered up Jesus. Amen. Amen. So that our faith in that would be able to allow us to come back into relationship with him. But, you know, one of the things that I want you to see is, is that in the sacrifice, if you'll remember, I talked about the fact that it had to be brought outside the camp. Mm -hmm. And so in reality, that means he had to be brought outside that that tented that wall that was around the tent and he had to be killed out there. And what I wanted to see in, Le in Leviticus chapter four, <laughs> verses 11 through 12 for the sin offering. If you read this scripture with me, it says <clears throat> the skin of the bullock and all his flesh with his head. See, they've already they've already opened this thing up and they've inspected it. And th there's only a portion of it of the sin offering that's burned. It's not the whole burnt offering. So there's only a portion of it that's offered on the altar and the rest of it. What we're going to read about right here, the skin, the flesh with its head, its legs, its inwards, its dung, the whole bullock. Shall they carry forth without the camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn him on the wood with fire where the ashes are poured out? Shall he be burnt? So all of this remaining part of the carcass that's not used for the sacrifice regarding the sin offering is brought outside the camp and is burnt outside the same location that this whole red heifer was burned. You understand what I'm saying? I wanted you, I just wanted you to see that because there's a context here, a concept where it was a separation. See, sin or the death of sin separated the believer from the tabernacle of God. The water of purification allowed a holiness or purification to separate him unto God. But this sacrifice was separated outside of the camp. In <coughs> Hebrews chapter 13, verses 11 through 13, it says right here, see, the book of Hebrews is a New Testament passage of Scripture that reminds us that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament types. And so in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 11 through 13, it says, For the bodies of those beasts... 
whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore into him, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Now, in order to really do justice to this passage, I would really have to break it down. So I'll try to do it quick because I know we're running low on time. The whole book of Hebrews, I've told you before, is written to Jewish believers who had converted to Christ, but now because of persecution are being drawn back to temple sacrifice. What the author right here is trying to say is this. You remember those Old Testament sacrifices? Remember the, you remember the red heifer? You remember the portions of the animal that had to be brought outside and burned outside the camp? Be, because because they, they represented the reproach of sin. So they had to be brought outside because that, that portion of them was unclean. Jesus, our Savior, he suffered outside the gate. So now he's talking about the whole city of Jerusalem. Now the temple's built inside the city of Jerusalem. Jesus had to carry that cross outside the city and go to Mount Calvary where he died on the cross. Jesus took our reproach upon him. He became a curse for us is what the scripture says. Not only did he hang on the cross and the father forsake him in the sense that did not look at him because your sin was placed upon him. But he was, he was outside the gate. He was outside the camp because he bore the sin and it represented. He bore the sin of you. He bore the sin of me. And it represented separation from the presence of God. And because of what he did on the cross, hallelujah, he now is restoring us back into yeah, yeah. the presence of God. But what these Hebrew Christians were doing is, they were like, man, it's too hard out here. People, and, and, it's, and it's worse than what it is for you, child of God. I just got to tell you. I mean, I don't know if you've tried to talk to people about Jesus out there or not, but sometimes they laugh at you. Sometimes they tell you that you're crazy. Uh -huh. Sometimes they'll remind you, you ain't nothing but an old addict and you're still the same way that you are. You ain't Amen. ever going to be changed and all that kind of stuff. But let me tell you something. They'll, they'll, they'll keep on pounding you because they don't know no better. And, but but let, me, let me tell you something. What, what I need you to know is, is that these Hebrew Christians were trying to go back to their, 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 the sacrifices of the temple because they were being persecuted. And, and, the, and the enemy of your soul sometimes will try to tell you to go back to your former way of life because it's just too hard. Man, I got people laughing at me. I got people, nobody wants to give me a chance. They don't want to give me a leg up. They, they don't believe that I'll ever make it. Listen to me. Hold on, Christian. Paul was telling these Christians, you got to go outside the camp. You got to suffer the reproach that Jesus did. You got to bear the stigma that he bore because you're his child. And even though the whole world look at you dirty, even though the whole world laughs, laugh at you and laugh you to scorn and treat you improperly. He bore your iniquity. He took your sin. He became a curse for you. Him who knew no sin became the sin offering. Hallelujah. So that we through him might become the righteousness of God. He did all of that for you. And now you got to understand that's and that's all representative of the ashes of the red heifer that it was outside the camp. He took the condemnation and the curse. He brought the reproach with him outside so that you and I could come back inside. Amen. And last thing I want you to know is this, is that they, you know, there's going to be a tribulation temple in the, in the, in the end times. Whenever we read about the fact this is going to be the temple that needs to be rebuilt. The Dome of the Rock right now is on a portion of where the Temple Mount used to stand. But some people say that they don't even have to break down the Dome of the Rock, that Muslim mosque, in order to rebuild the temple. But the Jews, once again, they don't believe that their Messiah has come. They're waiting for him still to come. And so in order for them to really feel like they're worshiping God, they have to reinstitute the temple. They have to reinstitute the sacrifices because they want to be close to God. If you do research, there's something called the Temple Institute. And the Temple Institute, one of the things to build the temple is, is that they got to get the ashes of a red heifer. I mean, these, and I'm telling you, I didn't really go into it, but it seems as though the, the requirements for this heifer were very stringent. And, and it just didn't show up all the time. And what they would do is they would burn this heifer and then they would take all the ashes and they would save it. And when it was time to make some more water purification, they'd take a little pinch and they'd put it in the water and they'd make the water. And then whenever that, they didn't have any more of that, they'd take a little pinch and they'd make the water. And like thousands, I mean, they, they, it wasn't like these heifers were showing up left and right. I mean, they might have had red heifers, but they didn't meet all the criteria. And supposedly there was one born in 2010. 
And see, these Temple Institute people are serious about this. They want to rebuild this temple. And in order to do that, they have to have the ashes of a red heifer. Because if you read in the book of Hebrews, it talks about the fact that Moses sprinkled all of the articles of the sanctuary with the waters of purification. And But what I need you to know is this, is that they're looking to build a uh, temple that's going to be resurrected for the tribulation times. For But what's going to end up happening is, is that they're going to sign a pact with the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is going to, in the middle of it, come against their covenant. And according to 2 Thessalonians, he's going to exalt himself in that very temple. And he's going to magnify himself and elevate himself as God. So that's the temple where the Antichrist is going to elevate himself. But I got good news for you. Because Jesus is the type and the fulfillment of Yes. The ashes of the red heifer, of that sacrifice of the heifer, which allowed you, allowed the believer to be purified and to be back into the presence of God. Once that little tribulation temple's out the way, we got a whole new temple on the way. And the whole new temple is the new heavens and the new earth. And it talks about it in Revelation chapter 21, <laughs> verses 1 through 4. Actually, I think I'm going to turn to my Bible because I might need to read Verses 5 to 21, 1 through, let's just read. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride, <clears throat> adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burn with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been some of these things. I sure have been a whoremonger. Lord knows I've been an idolater. Lord knows I've been a liar. But the difference between what these people are going to be, see, they're not going to be in that new heaven and new earth. They're not going to be in that place where the tabernacle of God is, where the presence of God is going to dwell with his people. These are people that weren't purified by the ashes of the red heifer. These are people that did not put their faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for them at the cross. Amen. Amen. These are people that are unworthy to spend eternity in the presence of God. And so once again, the whole scenario surrounding touching death or sin, the uncleanness of sin. The need for purification, which is the representation of Jesus dying for our sin. And ultimately the restoration and reconciliation of us being able to get back into the presence of God.